So obviously, as a mathematician and a physicist, I'm, we're all very used to, to sort of playing around with Greek letters. Omicron's a bit of an unusual one, right? As you probably know, the, the, uh, all the COVID variants are, are named after these, these Greek letters, and they've been going along in order. Uh, they got to the mu variant, and then they skipped to and went to Omicron. Obviously, the first thing you want to ask is, why did they skip, skip to? Well, the next letter after, after mu was, was nu, and they, did, they thought that was too close to, to new, as in something being brand new. And one after that was psi, which was thought to be too close to the name of the Chinese president. So they thought that was a bit bad. Nobody wants to be associated with a COVID variant. So they, they went straight to Omicron. Well, at least that's the theory. That's why they did it. But Omicron's a bit of a weird Greek letter. It's not one that we see that often in, a, as, you know, in maths, but it does exist and it does have a bit of history, which I think is, is quite interesting to talk about and certainly more pleasant to talk about, I think, than, uh, than the COVID virus. Well, I think we should go all the way back to the, to the second century uh, with Ptolemy who was, uh, you know, he wrote this Almagest, which was this big sort of article on astronomy, and he was using uh, Omicron there. One of the things we have to do is we have to understand a little bit about how the Greeks um, wrote their numbers. And they had this kind of alphabetic system. So, for example, alpha represented one, beta represented two, gamma re represented three, and so on. And they went like that until they got up to, up to ten, so it went up, you know, one to nine. They had special letters for ten special letters for 20, special letters for 30, and so on. And then they would just pile it all together. So I can give you an example, maybe just to illustrate it. Uh, the number 666, 666, devil's number. So a chi, and then I think this is a psi, and then a zeta, and then they'd put a line over the top. And what this means is, so this represents the number six, this represents the number 60, and this represents 600. Okay, so 666, so you put it all together. Incidentally, Omicron does appear in this, okay? It appears as the number 70. Okay, so Omicron, which is just more like that. What does it look like? Well, it's like, it's like an O, basically. But it also had another interesting use, or people have theorized that it had another interesting use in Ptolemy's system. So what Ptolemy did is he also wanted to, he was trying to describe astronomical systems, and he was thinking about, you know, sort of the, the angles in the sky, basically. So, of course, you have 360 degrees. You then have um, sort of 60 minutes and 60 seconds. That, that basically meant he was working with kind of like a sexagesimal um, number system. So he needed a way to sort of write those sort of 1 60th and, and 1 60th squares, i.e. the minutes and the, and the seconds. So suppose we wanted to do like 80 degrees, 41 minutes and 3 seconds, just for, you know, pick a random a one, one, okay? How would we write, how would Ptolemy have, have, have written that? So he would have done the 80, okay? So the symbol for 80 is, is pi. So you'd have put a pi in there. Then you'd have had a new column. Why is there a line above it, by the way? That's what it, to distinguish it from the from the actual letters. Okay, so they put the lines above it to, for the numbers. Okay, eighty is 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 pi. So that goes in the first column because that's the number of degrees. Second column. So now we need to do forty one. Okay, so forty is mu, and uh, one is alpha. So that's written like that. So that's 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 forty plus one, and then three is is gamma. So we put a gamma in there. Okay, so this, this is how you would have written it, this positional system. Then you have to ask the question, right, well, what if I didn't have any minutes? What if I had zero minutes? Okay, so I didn't really have a symbol for that. Well then, so, we, so what, what Ptolemy used was, well, he used this symbol, which people have said is an Omicron. Now, there's a lot of debate about this because some people say, well, is it an Omicron? How could it be an Omicron? Omicron's already 70. But maybe it was an Omicron because you couldn't put a 70 in any of these columns anyway because they only went up to 60, right? You know, 59. It, it didn't really... It could have got away with using an Omicron there. It was like the first symbol available to him that didn't have a use. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it had a use. You could, you could put an Omicron in this column, right? Because you could have 70 degrees. But, it's, but it wouldn't make sense to have a 70 in, in either of these columns, right? Because they only go up to 59. There's a bit of arguing about this. And another reason people say he might have used Omicron is that the Greek uh, word for nothing or none is orden, right? Which begins with an Omicron in Greek. So, so it kind of fitted in. So obviously, because of this, then people start to speculate, well, this does look a little bit like R0, right? A lot, actually, <laughs> a lot. So people speculate, well, how, are they connected? But th there's really no evidence that they are connected. In fact, almost certainly not connected. It's probably just a massive coincidence because I think, obviously, traditionally, people talk that the, 
that our zero came from much further east, uh, from India. So it's, it's almost certainly a massive coincidence, but that's this ancient use of, of Omicron. So now I think we need to get a little bit more modern. More recently, where has Omicron popped up in the mathematical literature? Okay, so I know you've, you've come across Donald News before, the great sort of computer scientist from, from Stanford. Obviously, we've seen him in the arrow notation, the famous arrow notation, which we use for Graham's number. So that's pretty cool. He has this really wonderfully cantankerous paper about Omicron and its use in the mathematical literature. I love this paper. It's so, it's just so angry. It's great. <laughs> so look, I've got it here. So this, this, is, this is the paper. Well, I say it's modern, but it, I mean, it was, came out the year after I was born. So it's not that modern, 1976. Here we are. So, so the title of the paper is Big Omicron, Big Omega and Big Theta. The reason he wrote this paper was because he was really getting a bit fed up with the way people were misusing Omicron in the mathematical literature and, and Omegas as well, actually. And he basically decided that somebody needed to fix the literature to sort out all the language that people were using and normalize it. And that's the point of his cantankerous paper, which literally just sets the sort of rules of what people should be using. So what is Omicron, and I guess Omega and Theta, to, to Donald News? Well, let me explain. It's to do with how sort of fast things grow. If I say that something is Omicron, big Omicron, some people call it big O, but he calls it Omicron, so we're going to go with that. If something says that big Omicron n squared, what does that mean? This means all the functions which are bounded above, so they're, they're, they're essentially smaller than things that grow like n squared. So let me, let me sort of do it graphically. So maybe that, that will explain. So suppose you've got, we're going to send n to infinity. Okay, so we're going to make n really, really big. So let me just draw n squared. Okay, grows like that. Okay, or this could be some multiple of n squared. This can be some, you know, some number m times n squared. Now, all the functions that this means, what does this actually mean? It means all the functions which don't quite grow as big as that. They don't get, they don't get as big as quickly as that. So they might do this. So they might go above, in, you know, small values of m, but eventually when you get big enough, they don't grow as fast. They always stay below some curve, which is a multiple of n squared. So there's always a curve, which is some multiple of n squared, which they stay behind. And that's what this, this notation means. Okay, now it's important notation for, for sort of uh, thinking about how sort of systems, you know, m maybe if you've got an algorithm and you want to work out how, how sort of efficient it is, so maybe you've got to sort out n things and you want to know, well, how quickly does, how many steps do I need to use? Is it order n, is it this? Is it this, this order n squared? Or is it, is it some other, something else? It gives you a feel for that. So it's really important in that kind of thing. Um, so obviously you can put any function in here, right? Okay, so you could do order n cubed uh, or the, you know, so, or any, any other function, like log n, anything, right? And you're just basically saying that, that, the, that the functions that you're talking about don't grow as fast as some multiple of that thing. What about, the other things that he's talked about in the paper. Well, they're kind of quite simple. So he has, you can imagine something like omega of n squared. That's kind of the other way around. They're the things that go faster than it, okay? The other side of the line. The other side of the line. So something like this. So this would basically say there was stuff which has also grown like, you know, some other n here, that they're always bigger than some other number times n squared. So they, they, they stay the other side of the line. They can always find something which is grown like n squared, some multiple of n squared, which, and this guy is, will grow faster. Then theta, which is the last one of the list, that means you're talking about all the functions which are above something that grows like n squared, some multiple of n squared, and below some, some other multiple of n squared. So they're kind of bounded on either side. These ones tell you all the functions that are below, these ones tell you all the functions that are above, and these ones tell you all the functions that are in between for some choice of m and, m and, and, and prime, as I've written it. So with Omicron and Omega, we don't need two lines, do we? Because they don't no. have to be between. But with, with theta, there needs yeah. to be two two lines to define our... Exactly, exactly. So theta's kind of more precise. It, t it tells you, it's really telling you an awful lot of information that it's really really growing like some multiple of n squared so it's really trapped between you know that growth two, two different growth rates which are very alike uh, whereas the other two sort of just give you an upper bound or a lower bound there's another area where these are used you don't just have to take things to infinity to use this notation you can take things to to constants or to zero 
And that's where I tended to come across this notation, this, this Omicron. If you could say, well, what is an Omicron of x squared as x goes to zero? This basically means all the functions which are smaller than x squared, okay? So then they're bounded above by x squared, so things like x, as x goes to zero. So you can think things like x cubed or x to the four. So as x goes to zero, they're always going, they don't, they're not growing as fast as x squared. So it's the same kind of idea. So for example, let's, let's draw the graph again. Let's draw something which goes like x squared, which is, which can be four times x squared or five times x squared. It's just a multiple of x squared. And we want all the functions which are, at, we're going to x equals zero now. So we're interested in what's happening down here. Okay, we're in the functions that are like an x cubed, which down here is, is growing more slowly. Okay, so all the functions which are trapped down here, but we're interested in what's happening down, down below. Okay, near zero. Because eventually x cube will overtake, in the other direction. It'll, It'll overtake, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so you couldn't have it, so it's, it's only a statement about what happens to x equals zero. So yes, yeah, you see here, so, so here we're interested in it staying below as we go to large values. Here we're interested in it staying below as you go to small values. But you can use the same notation for each. It just says you're bounded above by, by this thing, by these this set, the functions which go like x squared or two times x squared or three times x squared. Okay, and of course you can apply the same, the omega and the theta language there too. And this is really common in physics actually to use this. We use it in perturbation thing. One thing we do in physics is, is perturbation theory, which is where you take small stuff. So, you, you, so to actually do anything, you take really small quantities and you expanded it. You sort of consider the, the first correction in that quantity. Say something's like, let me give you an example. Uh, quantum electrodynamics. We have a small number in quantum electrodynamics, which is the fine structure constant, which is one over one, three, seven. That's a small number. So what you can do is you can calculate things to some sort of degree of accuracy in the fine structure constant. So if we want like roughly a 1% accuracy, we only need to take the first correction that's linear in the fine structure constant. And then we can go to higher order to things that go like the square of the fine structure constant. That would give us like 1% of 1% accuracy roughly. And you can go higher and you use this perturbation theory. And that's how you do physics. That's how you do physics. You can't read, without perturbation theory, physicists are useless. Okay, right? So, so we really need it. And obviously this kind of language, which is telling you how, what are all the things that you're sweeping under the carpet that you're ignoring? What are all, how fast are they growing? What are they bounded above by? If we were talking about something like the fine structure constant, we might say, oh, those terms are order alpha squared. You know, they're, 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 so we put an omicron alpha squared or omicron alpha cubed. They're the things, so everything that we've swept under the carpet that we're ignoring, they're bounded above by this thing. Okay, functions which grow like this thing. And that's the idea of, uh, uh, so this, this is the use of omicron in, um, in, in, in maths and physics. When they named this new variant Omicron, did you straight away go, oh yeah, I know that symbol, I use it all the time in physics? Well, I don't, see, this is the thing. I, I, funnily enough, I don't think it does get used. That. I never thought, I've used this all the time, right? This, this notation is so common, right? I use it in my lectures, I use it all the time when I'm writing stuff. I never thought of it as an Omicron, really. I never, it never occurred to me that it was an Omicron. I just thought, oh, it's just an O, right? You know, but... It's an Omicron, apparently, according to Donald. That's what it is. I should think of it as an Omicron, which I'm more than happy to do now. I saw some debate on, on social media. People say, oh, we, need, we all need to start writing papers with Omicrons now. And everyone's like, everybody's already doing it. And it's like, you just didn't realise. So I think that's quite cool. <laughs> Waiting for your chance to talk about it. What book is this here? This is a book called The Almagest by Ptolemy. And this particular edition is very, very old. 1515 is the publication date for this. It is the first published edition of this book. The book itself was actually written in about 150 AD. So I was asked on Twitter to calculate the number of SARS-CoV-2 particles, the, the particles that cause COVID-19, how many there were in the world. And so I did the calculation and it turns out that there are few enough to fit inside a regular can of Coke.